the places you can go. I think we live in the most amazing time in the history of the world. You can get on a plane in Nashville, Tennessee, and be almost any place in the world within 36 to 48 hours. Some of the farthest reaches, some of the countries that are most uh, distant from where we live, by planes, trains, and automobiles, you can get there within 36 to 48 hours at the most. It's, it's amazing if you think about it. And in this opportunity that we have, we live in a country with the greatest freedom to travel ever. And so we have the chance to take the hope of Jesus to all the places that we can go. You name the place, there's opportunities. Now we can't get into every country, but we have opportunities to go so many places wherever God's moving us to go, I believe he will make a way for us to go. And I don't know about you, but I love to travel. Anybody else love to travel? Okay, raise your hand high, let me see. Okay, I hereby anoint you missionaries to go around the world. There you go, my sermon's over. Awesome, y'all bought it, I love it, yes. When I got saved, I actually thought that my desire to travel for some reason was just mine. I actually thought it was just something I wanted to do because I had this sense of adventure. But the more I get to know God, the more I realize he puts things in us. And if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. And so for me, I found the closer I get to God, the more I get to travel, the more I get to do things for him that fill my soul. And here's the wild thing about God. We're gonna talk about worshiping him today and serving him today. Here's the wild thing about God. He has wired you so that the closer you get to him, the more you do the things that he's created you to do and called you to do, the greater the joy that comes on the inside. He's giving you this thing that we call the soul. And the soul is something he's put inside of everybody. It's, I don't know, I think soul is just a, a word we give it. But it's this connection he hardwired into us where we desire and we crave to worship. We don't really call it that. Sometimes we call it celebration. Sometimes we call it uh, passion. But we, we do. We crave it. We're wired for it. And when we worship, we connect. We connect with the living God. Now, here's what's amazing. I believe we will worship something. If not God, we will worship something. We will worship a pop artist. It blows my mind. I remember going at the age of 17 to a concert and seeing people. I mean, it was a worship service. It was not a singing service. I mean, people like, yeah, they're just begging to get on stage, throwing themselves at the stage, right? For that person that was there, it was a worship time. I see people do the same thing when it comes to sports. They worship their team. They, their weekend lives and dies on whether their team lives or dies. I see people do that with their job. Their whole worth is tied up in their, in their job and how well they do and how much money they make. I see people do that with their education. Their worth is tied to their grades and their performance and how they do. What if we foremost worshiped God? Would it change things? I, I believe it would. I believe it would fill our souls. Think of it this way, if your love is music, I mean, these guys, it's awesome what they did for us this morning. And for those that talk about the next generation and you know what they're not doing and everything, these guys were here at 6.30 this morning and they'll be here till 12.30 today, giving their lives to glorify God. So I, I'm excited about the future of the next generation. I'm excited because I see folks that are truly worshiping God and wanting to see a, a revolution of worship under the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So for them though, whoever their favorite is, or for you if it's worship, who would you love to tour with? Who would you love to be able to be on, in their band? 
What if they called you up tomorrow and they invited you? Maybe your thing is politics. Maybe you, you really just enjoy politics. And what if that person who's your governor that you voted for, your president, what if they invited you to be on their cabinet? Would that light your fire? What if you're a sports fan? Maybe, maybe you wish you were playing for the Braves right now. Those don't know they're playing the World Series. They're winning the World Series. This is a chance for Atlanta to finally win a national championship in something. Everybody's all excited. But don't worry, they still got three games they got to win. No, no offense, Atlanta. But what if baseball was your thing and you got invited to be on a World Series team? Would that light your fire? Of course it would. Here's my point. The king of king, the very best at everything, invites you and I to serve on his team. And when we do, it really will light our fire. When we discover what he's created you for and you walk in that, it will light your fire. It might be business, but you learn to do it to the glory of God. It might be education, teaching children, but you learn to do it to the glory of God. When you learn how God has wired you and you learn to do it to the glory of God, it will change the way you do your business. It will change the way you work. It will change the way you parent. It will change the way everything. When you realize that everything we do is a, a testimony to God. Well, I for one get excited that he wants me. He picked me. You know, as a, a little guy, you know, growing up, I, I, I mean, I wasn't ever tall. Matter of fact, first and second grade, I was always the kid that had to sit in the front middle when they took the picture. And I always say, little kids in front. Oh, I hated that phrase. Little kids in front, you know? It's like, okay, here I am, you know? So I was never the first picked when it came to sports because I was short and I was slow. So those aren't good recipes. Matter of fact, I think I, God wired my body for the sport of playing pool. I think that's what I can do well in my, in my athletic abilities. Uh, I love sports, but, but uh, never had the opportunity to be on the first team, right? But what if I was picked? What if when everybody else who I knew was better than me in the, that sport got overlooked and the player picked me to be on their team? Every now and then that would happen because they were my friend, right? They're like, oh, I don't want Steven to feel bad because he's a short kid. I'll pick him on my basketball team. And I get picked, but it meant the world to me, right? You need to know God has picked you. Not to be on the B team. Not to be on the JV team. God has picked you to be a first round draft pick at something. Everybody in here, I believe this with all my heart, everybody in here is gifted for something that you can bring great glory to God in. And you may not think it's even spiritual because maybe your gift, people skills, encouragement. Do you know that's a spiritual gift? Maybe your spiritual gift is encouragement and you just write notes to people and you tell people all the time how appreciative you are and you just don't even realize that's a gift from God. Maybe your gift is serving behind the scenes. Maybe you love to serve behind the scenes, but you don't realize that's special. You have been sold the lie by Satan that unless you're on the stage preaching or, or singing, then you're just not quite all that everybody else is. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. Everybody in here is a 10 in something. And God has wired everybody with something that they can glorify God in. That's what we're gonna look at today is how we, we're wired that way and how can we use that to fulfill the purposes of God. So uh, let's go Lord in prayer and then we'll jump in. Lord, I, I just wanna say thanks. Thank you so much that you have wired us and created us differently. Everybody's different in this room and I'm so grateful for it. But Lord, you created all of us for worship. And I pray that you help me share and explain it in a way that people walk out here going, wow, I wanna be a worshiper and I wanna declare the deeds 
and the glory of my king. Pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you got your listening guide, go ahead and pull that out. The, the, the starting point for this series has got to be why we do what we do. And we do what we do because God has created people for worship. It's the first thing on your listening guide. God created us to worship. Psalm 117.1, it's not on your listening guide, I'll just read it. Praise the Lord, all nations. Psalm 149.1, Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, and the congregation of the godly ones. God wants us to sing his praises. Genesis 4, look at Genesis 4. You can actually turn there, it's in the beginning of the Bible. In Genesis 4, we learn about Adam and Eve <coughs> and Cain and Abel. And in Genesis 4, we see the first offering ever taken in the history of mankind. It says, now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of his firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. If you follow the story on, this is where we learn the story of Cain killing his brother Abel out of jealousy. Why did God receive Abel's gift, but not Cain's? As I've studied this and looked at this, the only thing I can find is Cain presented some of his crops Abel sent his best portions. I want you to hone in on that for just a minute. Because I struggle with this in my life. As I was reading this and getting ready to preach, I was like, where is that true in my life? What part of my life do I bring God some of what I've got? And what part of my life do I bring him the best of what I've got? With all the skills and abilities that God's given you, with the, with the leadership traits, are you giving him only some of that in your life? Or are you giving your best to him? It's a whole lot easier to give God some of what I got than it is to give him the best of what I've got. But true worship is when I bring the best of what I have to the Lord. Now, what's amazing is when I bring my best to God, he is honored so much that he blesses us back, so much more so. I believe you cannot outgive God. And so the more you give, the more he blesses. The more you serve, the more he blesses. The more you use those gifts and talents for him, the more he blesses. The more you truly worship with your best, the more he blesses. He fills your soul. I think too many times, even as pastors, we can get caught up in the achievement race and miss the fact that God's desire is to feed our souls through worship. We worship him, which ascribes worth to him and glory to him, but because he created us for that, it provides worship to him and encouragement and hope and purpose for us. Now, I'm not into new cars a whole lot. I, matter of fact, that we were joking about it, but on the way over here, I was like, yeah, it would be nice if I had heat in my car. <laughs> my fan broke like 10 years ago, and I just always, you see me driving through town, I have the top down, have a jacket on, have a hoodie on, I'll just be freezing, but I'm, I'm enjoying the day, you know what I'm saying? I'm enjoying the moment. With, uh, but I was driving my mother-in-law's car the other day, and it was, it was a new car. It was a new car, and I was like, well, this is new to me. I, and I was like, man, why is this thing such a piece of junk? <laughs> I'm driving it, and every time I'd switch lanes, the, it was like it was out of a line. It would do this kind of number. I was like, why is it doing that? And then if I get a little too far to the right side of the road, it'd go again. I'm like, what is wrong with this car? They need to get this thing aligned. And, I'm dry, and I just finally said to her, I said, I don't know what it is about your car, but I don't like it. 
I said, it needs an alignment or something. I said, every time I get to switch lanes, this whole thing shakes. She said, are you using the turn signal? I was like, what? It's got some of this super duper spyware stuff on it. <laughs> that if you change lanes without the turn signal, it shakes to let you know you're crossing the line. I'm like, well, that's what my eyeballs and my brain are for, I thought. But I guess not anymore, right? Well, I can resist it, and it drives me crazy. Or I thought, hey, I can embrace it, and I can kind of chill out a little bit because it'll shake whenever I'm going over that line. I just close my eyes. <laughs> I didn't do that. Now, it's the same thing with worshiping God. He's got this awesome life for you. And you can stick to your old ways and drive the car without heat and have to put a coat on and struggle through things. Or you can embrace what he has for you and worship him and be humbled before him and glorify him and recognize he is the one worthy of all worship and embrace that and celebrate it with all that you have and all that you are. And then you'll discover this new thing that he's wired you for all along. But the first thing he wants is true worship. First thing he wants before he wants to use you to do things for him is to have a relationship with him. That's the privilege that he gives us. He wants us to know him. He wants us to bring our best, not some of our food, but the best of his, our food. Not some of who we are, but the best of who we are. Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1 says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. That's what I'm doing with you right now, guys. I am pleading with you. I want you to discover this. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is the, truly the way to worship him. Our lives surrendered completely to him is truly the way that we worship him. You can worship him at school by the way you do school. You can worship him on the job by the way you do your job. You can worship him in your family by the way you live out your faith in your family. You can worship him uh, in, your, in your hobbies by the way you do your hobbies. In all things, we can worship God and give him glory for our daily lives. But it's up to us whether we choose to do that, whether we give him some of what we got or the best of what we've got. Well, the second thing, God wants worshipers from all nations. All nations. Psalm 117, one again says, praise the Lord, all nations. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. God's plan has always been for all nations. That's always been his plan. It's never just been one nation. Even when he had the Jewish nation, he was utilizing them to take the good news to the whole world. That was the purpose. Read the book of Jonah. Over and over again throughout the Old Testament, God is sending prophets to all nations. The Jewish nation was designed to be a testimony to others. And oh, by the way, if you're not 100% Jewish, anybody 100% Jewish in here? Maybe one or two, we had somebody in the first service. If you're not 100% Jewish, you better thank the Lord that he wants the gospel for all nations because that includes you and me. We are part of those other Gentile nations that because he calls the gospel for all nations, you and I have been included in that. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Jesus is talking about what will take place right before he returns from heaven to take us home. Matthew 24, 30 and 31, Jesus said, and then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there'll be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth, 
and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. The gospel is for all peoples. That's why we've got to do what God's called us to do, which is go after all peoples. As a church, we have a vision. We call it the 5555 vision. It comes from the Acts 1 8 passage that we saw in the little video of taking the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And we have got to be a part of taking the good news all around the world. You know, the Bible says that He created us, mankind, in His image. That means that our heart, our soul, our, our thoughts, they're all gifts from God as long as they're not sinful. Those are ours and the devil's, right? So as we think of that, here's what I want you to know. God has wired you. He has wired you for faith. He has wired you for worship. And he has wired you to tell that to the nations. And he's wired you for variety. How many of you right now, if I gave you a trade right now for a classic car, for whatever you're driving, you'd be in on it. I'm thinking a 1973 Ford Pinto, white. Anybody wanna, not, wanna trade for a 1973? Some of you don't even know what a Pinto was. It was a really cool design. You ram it in the back and it blows up. Great for movies, horrible for families, okay? 1973 white Ford Pinto. Now, we like variety, don't we? How many in the parking lot have a white car? I think it's the most popular cover, color, so it's probably about 20, 25%. But if you got there and look, you got white cars, you got black cars, you got yellow cars, you got blue cars, you got Chevys, you got Fords. Why am I saying that? Because we like variety and God does too. He loves all the nations, all the races, all the colors. And let me just put this real clean and real simple. If you are a racist, you need to repent. You need to ask God to forgive you because those are not his ideas and that is not his heart. He created all peoples for his glory to worship him. And listen, I get it. Maybe you're raised in a culture that down talked to certain people group. Maybe it was a color, maybe it was a nationality, maybe it was the next town over. Well, those people, they're from Cookville. Oh, yeah, 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 right? Here's what I will tell you. Jesus' blood was shed for every soul that walks this earth, and no one is less or more valuable than the other. And so we've got to get that. Yeah, you can celebrate that. I celebrate Jesus, what he's done. And because of that, we must take that good news and share that with all the nations because guess what? Not everybody believes that. Not everybody believes that. Historically, we haven't always believed that as a nation or even as Christianity. But I'm thankful for living in the day when things have, the tide has turned. I'm thankful for living in a day when, when we are understanding that God loves all people of all nations of the world and we get the chance to let them know the hope of Christ. Revelation 5, 9 explains what it's gonna be like in heaven. It says, and they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you are slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. They're all gonna be there, everybody. And so, God has created us to embrace that. Now, you, knew who, you know who loves racism? The devil. He loves to divide us based on our eye color, skin color, based on how much money we make. Some of the greatest racism is based on classes, even in our country. Well, they're rich. I'm sure they're snobby. 
Well, they're poor, they probably don't work. Well, they're, they're this, they're that. We can, we can prejudge people based on our predetermined ideas. And even that's wrong. We need to try to see people through the eyes of God. When we worship God, we realize that when we get to heaven, there's gonna be all nations around that throne. It's gonna be for your awesome choir, guys. I'm gonna be able to carry a tune. I know it. I'm believing it in faith that in heaven, I'm gonna be able to sing and people are gonna go, oh, way to go, Taboo. I'm gonna go, yeah, yeah. Big part of heaven. We'll be singing worship, but living worship before him. You know, when I went to um, East Germany, I got the privilege of going to East Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was like within 12 months when the Berlin Wall fell, I got to go. And I'm walking through this town that is so dark. It was so dark because communism spreads the darkness. And they had cars in, in, in communist East Germany. And the cars were called Trabis. You look them up sometime. True story, they're made out of cardboard. Craziest thing. They had them, they were just all over the place, parked on the side of the road, broken down because nobody wanted them once the wall fell down. Literally, the, the, fr the frame was metal, but like the fenders were made out of this glued cardboard stuff. And they only came with two options. One is color. You could get white or gray, I think is what it was. A lot of selection there. Or you could get it with radio or without radio. Woohoo! yeah. And you had to wait years to get it. And as I walked around this communist country that had just become Democrat uh, when the wall fell down, as I walked around, the dreariness and the depressiveness, everything was like gray or black. It was like there was no color. As I walked around, there's one thing I noticed, like people didn't wear color. That Everybody just wore the same thing. It was so depressing. I was like, God is not that way. Look at the colors of the flowers of the field. I love seeing the birds when I go to different areas and you see the bright yellows and the bright oranges and you see the different flowers. You go to a botanical garden or just driving through the town when it's that season. I love the flowers and the trees now, amen? You love the changing of the trees, isn't it beautiful? God did that, people. He could have made everything gray, but he didn't. And we've got the good blessing of telling other people it was him. We can brag on God all day long. When the changing of the colors, you got a natural way. People say, I, I don't know how to talk to people about Jesus. Well, I tell you what, this week, I want to challenge everybody. you got an easy way. When you're with somebody, say, hey, have you seen the changing of the colors? And they go, yeah. Say, isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Isn't God an artist? Hmm. Because let me tell you, everything could be all gray, but God created color, not just in trees, but also in people. And God desires worshipers from all lands. The last thing is the result of worship is to tell his good deeds. The closer you get to God, the more you can't shut up about God. That's the bottom line. The more I worship him, the more I can't shut up. Here's what it says. Psalm 911, sing praises to the Lord who reigns in Jerusalem. Tell the world about his unforgettable deeds. Tell everyone, tell the world, let the world know what God has done in you and through you. Now, I'm just gonna brag right now. I came home last night and my wife had this southwestern meal that she tried some recipe off Pinterest or something. I'm just telling you, it was killer. Like, I just brag on her from stage. I try not to embarrass her too much, but this was the real, I mean, like, and it had cheese dip with it. I'm just saying, southwestern and cheese dip, how do you go wrong with that, right? And so I, I, I'm bragging in front of all you guys how great that meal was. And I'm excited about it. When I'm, when I'm well fed, I'm a happy guy, right? Brag on the fact that a couple weeks ago, my, my dad's favorite restaurant is uh, the Golden Corral. They got these chocolate covered strawberries. You been there? Oh my goodness. I, this last time we went, I decided instead of calling it dessert, I called it pre and I went and got them first. 
I was like, they may not be there when I get to the end of this meal. So I went and got five of them. Everybody else getting everything. They come back, I'm just eating them chocolate-covered strawberries. Like, woo, life is good. Bragging on them, right? When you are excited about God, you can't help but testify. And how do you get excited? You worship him in your heart each day, spending time with God, and you tell others good news. Now, it doesn't mean you're called to go overseas, although I think you can. I think we are desperately shorthanded around the world, and I wish there were more people that were called, but we have opportunities here as well. I wanna show you a couple pictures here. Some of the folks in our church, that just the Spirit of God touched them. This is a part of a team, uh, tow trucks for Jesus. Uh, they were tow trucks for Todd, one of the guys in our church, found out that there are a lot of foster kids that didn't have toys uh, for Christmas, so he took it upon himself to start toy tr trucks for t tow trucks, toy truck, tow trucks for tots. And uh, so they've got an event coming up and they're part of that. Go to the next one. Uh, this is a group that's doing a, a cookout for international students. And you see this guy right here, see he's got a video on the fire. Some of these folks, this was the first time they'd ever had a hot dog roast. Now I'm not saying that's the best thing that we export from America is a hot dog roast. <laughs> But they were excited about a first time hot dog roast. These guys from all different countries around the world and people in our church put this on that we might connect with them. Next one. Uh, this one here is the guy on the left is a uh, Iranian pastor that was basically tortured and beaten in Iran, moved to Turkey and he pastors refugees in Turkey. And when it, we were talking about, he had his uh, immigration uh, meeting coming up and uh, the guy I was with asked him, he said, well, if you get selected to go to America, do you want to go to America? He said, oh no, I want to stay here. This is where I'm, God has called me to be effective among these people. These are my people. And he's, I mean, financially it's a struggle, but he wants to be where God's called him. There's a guy that he chooses that. Next one, uh, this is somebody in our church here, this is Robert, uh, and James got cut out of the picture, but our life group, our men's life group, we went and just cleaned up. <laughs> I don't know that Robert knew that was gonna show up there. Uh, uh, we, we took the team up there to Prayer Mountain, and we cleaned the spot on top of Prayer Mountain so people could have a place to go and connect with Jesus. You drive to the top, there's some seats up there, and you'll see two crosses going into the woods. You can go in either side or out either side. And there's like this amazing rock garden there to go and connect with Jesus with you or with a group of people. So people just using what God's given them as skills. The next one, uh, this is our team for man camp. These are the guys that won. Several of these guys were mentors. Let's see, one, two, three, four of those guys are mentors that were mentoring other kids uh, from Lighthouse Camp or elsewhere choosing to give their weekend to help a kid learn about Jesus Christ. And then the last one. Oh, is that Luke photobombing Luke? I saw that. And then this one here, uh, our hospitality team. Fix, we fix lunches, we fix breakfast for the public school teachers in the schools that we've adopted, Jerry Whitson, Cane Creek, and Upperman. Listen. You may not be called to preach. You may not be called to lead worship, but you are a 10 in some area for Jesus. You gotta figure out what that is and you gotta do that for Jesus. Do it as an act of worship, not as, oh, I guess I'll teach the kids this week. No, as an act of worship, we have that privilege to the glory of God. I want you to watch these missionary stories as they talk about serving this summer at Lighthouse Camp serving the under-resourced in the Upper Cumberland. I saw God moving this year at Lighthouse this summer was just like through the kids. Some kids were easier to talk to, some were harder, but I saw God working through all of them. And as he did, he helped me and the kids understand God a little more. And I saw many, many amazing girls come to know the Lord and 
just how they grew and how they went home carrying that joy of Jesus. So um, I had one kid in my cabin, and it's so hard to pick one because, like, I've had I've had so many like great kids in my cabin who just like got their lives changed. But there was this one kid, and uh, we're gonna call him Jim. I can't, I can't say his name, but um, I was at morning meeting one time, and I get a letter, and I was really confused because that doesn't happen very often. But this is what it reads: um, Hello, I would have addressed you by name, but I do not know who you are. I wanted to take a moment first and foremost to thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your life to teach these young men about God and how much he cares and loves them. It's important in today's world to continue his ministry. And also, I wanted to tell you to be patient with Jim. He can be the biggest thorn in your behind, but I promise if you give him a chance, you will see that he's the sweetest, most loving kid. He talks a lot, and a lot is capitalized and underlined. So you may have to get on to him and be patient with him. And he thinks he has a lot of important stuff to say. He really is a wonderful kid. And I'm so glad he got to come to camp that I did when I was a kid. It really blessed me and taught me so much. Sincerely, Jim's big sister. God bless. I'm so, I'm so um, happy to say that Jim, I'll be seeing Jim in heaven. Um, he accepted the Lord as his Savior. And that's just... It's so special. I actually got this letter right after that happened, and like, man, I think that's one of the most awesome experiences I've ever had, both in general and at Lighthouse. Okay, so I was able to be a counselor for two years. And my first year, I had one of these girls in my cabin, and she had like no self-confidence. Like she was even struggling to like roast a hot dog over a fire. So during that week, I was able to um, help her and experience new things that she wouldn't normally do. And at the end, um, we always write a letter for a sponsor. And um, like for when she was writing it, I literally had to help her with every single word. Well, she came back this year. And um, she was in my cabin, but I was able to see her anyway. And um, on the last day, she wrote the sponsor letter. And it was really cool because she didn't even ask for help. She was able to write the whole thing by herself. And it was just so cool to see her grow. And I'm pretty sure she even roasted that hot dog by herself. Or, you know, we encouraged her, but it was really cool to see her grow with self-confidence and learn who she is in Christ. So that was really cool. One story in particular, I had a camper who was in and out of homes and in and out of foster care systems and different things like that. And she came up to me during one of the chapels that night and she came back and she says, Miss Michaela, I don't, I don't know how to believe in God because he's just invisible and how am I supposed to know that he's really there? And I proceeded to tell her just to have faith and just believe that he's really here and he'll reveal himself to you. And just by prayer and uh, my fellow counselors just being in prayer for her, she came back the next night at chapel and she told me that she wanted to receive Christ into her heart. Uh, it totally impacted my life. Uh, every morning I'd wake up around 5.20, do a Devo, and that Devo was really important for me. Even though we did chapel twice a day, it was important for m myself to get right with God and to get into the Word. And it really challenged me to be more evangelical and share God's Word with those around me, because on a regular basis, you're sharing devos, and it really helped my leadership skills, and definitely the counselors did. So we had 11 students this year donate time out of their summer, some of them the whole summer, to serve people they'd never met before, sharing with them the hope of Christ because Christ had changed their heart. So for those who are saying, I don't know about this next generation, I got a lot of hope. But what about this generation? If the Lord told you quit your job today and spend the whole summer serving the under-resourced, would you say, yes, Lord? 
If the Lord told you to, to give up your career, to become a foster parent, would you do that? One of the families out at the camp, that's what they did. He had a, his own business, very successful. Felt led to give it all up and move there to become a foster parent at, the, at their home for four kids. For some of you, we're gonna talk about this next month, but for some of you, that's the step you need to take. God's calling you to foster. God's called you to adopt and you've been fighting it. For others, God's been calling you to serve in the, the youth ministry and you've been too busy. For others, you've been called to, to serve with the children in the children's ministry. For others, senior adult ministry, I don't know. But everybody in this room is a 10 somewhere. Where is he calling you to serve? To the glory of God. I want you to stand with me and uh, Eli is gonna come out and he's gonna lead us in a song. But I want you to hear this passage in Revelation. It says, who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous deeds have been revealed. God alone is holy. This morning you took of the Lord's Supper, saying that Jesus Christ, if you took it, you were declaring Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you did that this morning, I wanna ask you, if the Lord is calling you to go, will you go? Will you go across the street to your next door neighbor? If he's calling you to start a ministry to the homeless, will you do that? If he's calling you to start a ministry to your coworkers, a Bible store to you in, in your workplace, will you do that? Part of worship is giving him all that you are and all of yourself. So some of you today, as Eli plays, you may want to come to the right side and just have that conversation with God. Maybe he's been wrestling with you on something and you just need to come and pray by yourself. For others, you may want somebody to come pray with you. Maybe you feel like God's calling you to something, but you don't know what it is, and you'd like someone to pray with you about it. Come over here to the left side. I'll be down front. If you're here and you've never yet experienced the love of God in your life, and you'd like to have more questions, I'll be down front. And then the prayer room will be open. There'll be a couple in there. Maybe there's something that you really need a moment to unpack and have someone listen to you and pray with you about. They'll be back there to do that. You laugh, you'll play a song, and as God leads, you come. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We would love to get connected more with you online, so please go to our website, online.therivercc.com. There you can go and click on the connections. Also, if, if you're looking for prayer, or even if you want to give, you can go to online.therivercc.com. We want to encourage you to go to our YouTube page, so please go to youtube.com in the search box type the river community church there you'll find our logo there and just hit the subscribe button so that way you can search any messages from weeks before and not miss out on any of those messages thank you so much for joining us today